Good night, good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. No, that's not a leaked quote from the Brexit negotiations between Britain and the European Union. That is, of course, that romantic farewell from Romeo and Juliet. But Britain's departure from the European Union isn't the only grim goodbye. In our personal lives, friendships, marriages, once characterized by mutual trust and dignity, at the point of separation, they turn bitter and divisive. And so is the case in our work lives as well. And when it's time for someone that we love to pass away, our goodbyes are filled with so much sorrow and so little sweetness. So why does how we say goodbye matter so much? Why is it so incredibly hard? And what can we learn from Brexit and other familiar farewells about values, life, and leadership? So why does how we say goodbye matter so much? Well, values matter most when they're tested. And there is no greater test than the moment we say goodbye. The moment we say goodbye is the moment we establish our true legacy. And I believe is as important as the whole time that we are together. We're here to speak about values. The moment of goodbye tells us whether those values mean anything at all. So we need to get better at saying goodbye. We need to talk about saying goodbye before it's too late. A mother on her deathbed at home held her son's hand gently. With tears in her eyes, she says to him, there are three types of people in this world. Adders, subtractors, and multipliers. The adders, when you're with them and when they leave you, you feel added to, energized. The subtractors, when they leave, and you know who they are, you feel diminished depleted. It's as though to add to their own energy, they take something from you. And then there are multipliers who are so full of inspiration that when they leave you, they set off something exponential, the multiplier effect. Life will never be the same again. This dying mother chose her moment of goodbye to be a multiplier, to sow a super seed of inspiration that would germinate in her son's heart and in the hearts of all those who would hear her message. How many of us, if we put our hands on our heart, can say that most of our most meaningful goodbyes have been multipliers or even adders? I dare say many of them have been subtractors. And this matters because when we have a bad buy rather than a good buy, from an evolutionary perspective, our very survival could be at stake. We know from the four and a half billion year story of evolution that while competition is the key for species to survive, it is kindness, collaboration, compassion, the formation of symbiotic relationships that is the key for species to thrive. So when we say goodbye, which is a contraction of God be with ye, we're wishing the other party well, to fare well, because we know that it is in our enlightened self-interest to leave on good terms. When Juliet says to Romeo, that I say good night till it be morrow. She knows that she will have a future social connection 
with her Romeo. And again, it's to their mutual benefit to be on good terms. And so it is with Brexit. Britain and the European Union know that they will have to sit down on the morrow and negotiate a huge trade deal. So the quality of our goodbyes matter. Because if we have a bad buy, if we don't fare well, then our collaborator, someone who could be our symbiotic relationship, our partner, could turn into a competitor and we get gobbled up. And we know from experience that destructive goodbyes can leave a trail of destruction, not just for those who are directly involved, but for the ecosystems that we are all attached to. When I was seven years old, this is me wearing that charming jumper. Thanks, Mum. I was here with my big sister, Natalie, when she was 10. And this was the tender age where our parents decided to say their goodbyes and have a divorce. And it was really tricky. Some of the language, the tone of the communication around this goodbye was difficult. It was difficult, of course, for them, but it was really challenging for my sister and I. There was blame games and finger pointing. And certainly for me, and I think my sister would agree, even 30 years later, the pain from that wound of that goodbye is still felt. And this matters on a global scale. When we think of Britain and the European Union, about the tone and language of the goodbye, it matters so much. And it matters because who is affected is not just two political trading partners, but their 513 million people who are their 513 million children who are affected by this divorce settlement. So we know that goodbyes matter because values matter most when they're tested, and there's no greater test than when we say goodbye. We know they matter because our very survival could be at stake. And not just our survival, but generations to come can feel the negative or positive impact of our goodbyes, whether they are adders, subtractors, or multipliers. But goodbyes also matter because we are saying goodbye more than ever before. The idea of a job for life is now a thing of the past. In a recent survey, 91% of millennials say they expect to stay in their job for less than three years. In their working life, that could be 20 jobs. That's 20 goodbyes from work alone. As a species, we're on the move now more than ever before. In 2017, there were 258 million people, that's one in 30, living in a country different to the one of their birth. The latest projections suggest that that figure could raise to 405 million by 2050. And with a catastrophic impact of climate change, that figure could be even higher. So we're saying goodbye from where we live, from where we work, so we better get better at saying goodbye. So how do we do it? Well, first, we need to understand why saying goodbye is so incredibly hard. And there is, of course, a whole spectrum of goodbyes. There's the casual, the temporary. I'm just popping out to get some tacos. I'll see you later to that emotional tug of the hug in the airport when a loved one is moving to the other side of the world. But I believe that there are universal principles within every goodbye, that if we can understand them, if we can apply them, we can leave that legacy of love, of hope, of compassion. When the phone rang, my heart sank. 
it was my best friend Gib's mother. And she told me that Gib had a brain tumor. He was in a hospice and he only had a few days left to live. Would I like to say goodbye? So I got the train to the north of England and I saw him in the hospice. His wavy hair was gone, he was completely bald. He couldn't speak, but he didn't need to. His eyes still had that mischievous twinkle. We sat there together in silence for some time. And after a while, I walked up to him, whispered in his ear, I love you. And I left. A few days later, I was at the pub with friends after work. We're having fun. And then out of the blue, I can't explain this, but out of the blue, I just burst into tears. I knew at that very moment he was gone. That was 13 years ago. Why is it so hard? I mean it. Why? I mean, after all, we all say goodbye. It's not a question of if. It's a question of when. It's a question of how. All of us will say goodbye from this event. We will say goodbye to our organizations. We will say goodbye to our partners. And yes, we will say goodbye to this life. So why is it so difficult? Why is it so hard when our landlord phones us up out of the blue and says, I'm sorry, it's time for you to move on? Why is it so difficult when our political partner says, we've had a referendum and I'm sorry, but our 43-year relationship has got to come to an end? And when a loved one passes away, why are we filled with so much grief and heartache? Well, I think one of the core reasons why saying goodbye is so incredibly hard is because we fabricate veils of permanence. We sign permanent contracts at work. We sign up to 25, 30 year mortgages with the bank. And we say to our partner across the aisle, till death do us part. And when we start a job, we don't talk to our employers about how we'd like to leave, even though the global average suggests that we will stay in that job for no longer than four and a half years. When we're happily married, we don't talk about how we'd like to separate or divorce, even though statistically one or two marriages will end this way. And rarely, when we're healthy or well, do we talk about how we would like to die, even though one wise person famously said, the global mortality rate stays steady at 100%. So we don't talk about it. We buy into these ideas of permanence. And that's okay, that's natural. Particularly for children, it's healthy to have an idea of stability, of security, so the children don't need to look over their shoulder and can have a sense of continuity. But there's a risk that as we get older, these veils of permanence become fixed in our minds. Even though we know from neuroscience that the mind doesn't stay still, that everything within the mind, our perceptions of self, all of our sensory perception, wave like the ocean. We know that the universe is in constant flux, and yet, we still buy into these ideas of continuity. 
And what this means is that when change comes along, as it inevitably does, we resist it. It's why when we have catastrophic climate change, we resist making the changes we know that we need to because the story of climate change is out of kilter with our stories that we tell ourselves, that we fabricate for ourselves of a never-changing world, of happily ever after. It's why when we're cooking dinner and our friend says to us, I'm just popping out to get some tacos, I'll see you later. It's why we say, but I, I thought that we were, you were going to eat here tonight. It's why when our political partner has a referendum, we say, oh, but I thought that we had a strong and stable relationship. And it's why when a loved one dies out of the blue, we are feel, filled with so much grief. When we're not prepared for change, we resist it. And it's this dissonance between, on one side, our hope and expectations of a permanent world with the reality of an ever-changing universe that is a key cause behind why saying goodbye is so incredibly hard. And another reason is that when it comes to saying goodbye, we pay so much attention to the sorrow and so little to the sweetness. When confronted by death, we see only death and not, as Frida Kahlo would have us, see the sweetness of living life. Viva la vida, of celebrating life. When we lose that which is most precious and important to us, we focus on our loss and turn our back on the fact that there is always hope. When we say goodbye, it only hurts so much because we care so much. What we are experiencing when we say goodbye is our true capacity to love. When I whispered goodbye into Gibbs' ear, at that moment I was overcome, overwhelmed by loss, yes, but also by abundance. When we say goodbye, we are fully human, and within that humanity is an invitation to leadership, an invitation to live that values driven life we have always wanted. As Khalil Gibran said, ever has it been that love knows not the depth, its true depth, until the hour of separation. There's a wonderful uh, shaman called Martin Prechtel who gives a talk called Grief and Praise, which I commend to you all. And in it, he says that grief is praise because it's the natural response of the heart to honor that which it misses. So what if we could look within, deep within, the sorrow of our goodbye and see that sweetness? And I believe that the pain that we feel, the pain that I felt when I said goodbye to Gib, the pain that I feel when I wanted Britain to remain in the European Union, the pain that we all feel at that point of goodbye is not our own pain alone. It's shared shared with our ancestors, and it's shared with all others around the world. We should be under no illusion that right now there are seven and a half billion hearts stretched and strained by the existential effect and threat of climate change. A mourning, a great mourning and grief for our departure from our true nature as stewards of this earth. And this macrocosmic grief feeds directly into our microcosmic goodbyes. They are not separate. There's that symbiotic relationship again between the microcosm and the macrocosm. 
And so we're not just feeling our own grief at the point of goodbye, we are sharing the world's grief. But so the opposite is also true. Because deep within the grief, the mourning with climate change, the mourning that we are seeing around the world, is also a deep love. Behind the grief of climate change is a deep-seated love of people and planet. Wouldn't it be amazing if when we were tears and hair disheveled and crying and mourning at that moment of goodbye, we could be like, wow, I've got such an amazing capacity to love. Isn't that, aren't we incredible as a human species that we've got so much love? What if we could look within our sorrow and see that sweetness? So how do we make goodbyes better? Well, we need to lift that veil of permanence. Kiss the lips of change. And only then can we begin to marry our expectations with our reality. So we need to contemplate the nature of change. Integrate it, systemize it. And Mexico is way ahead of Britain in this department. And I don't just mean the whole Brexit omni-shambles. Here we have Dia de Muertos, Day of the Dead, a ritualized, systemized, annual honoring of the dead a reflection of the nature of change, because death is change in all its manifest glory. Every single year, and in Mexico for over 3,000 years, there have been rituals to honor our ancestors. This is healthy, this is important. In fact, I'd say it's necessary. I wonder, actually, whether it's one reason why the divorce rate in Mexico is one of the lowest in the world. Less than one divorce every thousand people. But seriously, if we reflect systematically on the nature of change, we're much less likely to take each other and the natural world for granted. Once I can see your mortality, once I know our relationship not just might but must come to an end, our current relationships are imbued with more meaning and purpose. So how to say goodbye? I think the first step is to actually say goodbye. It's tempting sometimes to let meaningful relationships drift just so that we don't have to face the music of that awkward confrontation and say goodbye. But that misses the point. It misses the gift, the opportunity of goodbye. Because if we can say goodbye, say it kindly, say it gently, and say it clearly, it's a liberating gift. It enables us to swim in different directions in unpolluted waters. It allows us to travel lightly, unencumbered by the baggage of the past, unencumbered by ambiguity. Does she still like me? Uh, does he still want to work here? Um, do they still want to be my political partner? There's clarity. A clear and kind goodbye is a liberating gift that is an essential tool in the armory of the leader. And it's important to make something of our goodbyes. When I was 24, I set up Global Tolerance, an international communications agency to spread messages of hope. We represented people like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Gandhi, his grandson, um, Ted and the Charter for Compassion. And I loved it. I absolutely loved my job. It didn't feel like work. It felt like an extension of my heart. But another extension of my heart is my wife, 
gave birth to our first beautiful daughter, Seren. And at that moment, I knew that I needed to say goodbye to the company that I loved because I couldn't give the organization the full focus and attention that it deserved because I wanted to give my family the full focus and attention it continues to deserve. You're right, they are great. <laughs> Thank you, you may have seen them earlier. Um, I set up a new exit strategy, a new way to say goodbye to an organization, and it's called an open leadership exercise, or OLE for short, to celebrate the ending. Why must it be filled with doom and gloom when it can be a celebration? And it was a global open search process. Anyone around the world, if they wished to, could apply to be the new owner and leader of this international communications agency with a conscience. And the process was incredible. It inspired all kinds of wonderful people to believe that they too had the capacity to lead such an organization. I ended up giving away the company to two of the competing finalists in the process. Unfortunately, that partnership didn't work out. Two years ago, the company folded. But that's okay. It's okay. Because all organizations must come to an end. We all need to say goodbye. It's not a question of if. It's a question of when, it's a question of how. And I feel so grateful because I know that that process, the OLE, was a multiplier process for so many people and inspired scores of people to start up their journey of entrepreneurship. I think one of the simplest and most effective ways to say goodbye better is to meditate, if only for a few minutes every day. Because, as I said before, when we sit and reflect simply on the nature of mind, on the nature of our world, we see that it is full of change. Our thoughts wave. Our feelings wave. Our physical sensations they wave as well. And if we can systematically engage with the nature of change, then guess what? When change comes along in the form of a goodbye, we are better able to adapt to it, to respond to it, rather than rage and lock horns. And let us ritualize our goodbyes. When we leave this event, let us light a fire not in the building, by the way, I must stress that, but let us light a fire. When our, our partner leaves, let's, let's dance and get naked. When someone leaves work, let's have a boozy going away party. Let's turn our everyday transitions into rites of passage. Because when we truly make something of our goodbyes, we see within every goodbye is a hidden hello. We see that our goodbyes are not so final after all. As Tom Stoppard said, look on every exit in into an, as an entry into some place else. Every goodbye, there is a hidden hello. In truth, though, there is no goodbye. Goodbye is what Einstein would have called an optical delusion of consciousness. There is no separation. So yes, while it's true that everything in the universe waves and changes on a continuous basis, so it is also true 
that every single thing in this universe is intimately interconnected in ways beyond our current comprehension. So when you leave this event, when Britain says goodbye to the European Union, and yes, when our loved ones pass away, know this, whether we like it or not, we're stuck with each other. Thank you.